1988, Interplay Entertainment released Wasteland, an open-world post-apocalyptic CRPG to critical and commercial acclaim. Wasteland's setting and general concepts would serve as a basis for one of Interplay's most heralded projects, Fallout. Through its unique retro-futuristic aesthetic, turn-based combat, exploration, and RPG mechanics, Fallout became one of the best-selling games of 1997 and established a franchise, with several sequels and spin-offs released in the following years. The success of Fallout and Wasteland, among other titles as well, didn't last for Interplay though. By the early 2000s, the company was in dire straits financially. To try and salvage the company, Interplay auctioned off the intellectual property rights of Fallout to Morrowind and Oblivion developer Bethesda, who would fully acquire the rights in April of 2007 for nearly $6 million. Although Interplay would never be the same, the Fallout brand had a resurgence with the release of Bethesda's Fallout 3 in 2008. Fallout 3 revitalized the post-apocalyptic series, taking it in a new direction from its isometric turn-based roots. Fallout 3 made nearly $300 million in the first few months after release, with lifetime sales eclipsing over roughly 13 million copies. The success of Fallout 3 was not lost on Bethesda. Just two years after the release of Fallout 3, Bethesda Softworks tasked Irvine, California-based developer Obsidian Entertainment with creating the next installment in the franchise. What released in 2010 was, at least in my opinion, the best modern Fallout game and one of the best RPGs this millennium, Fallout New Vegas. Obsidian, somehow, cranked Fallout New Vegas out in just 18 months of development time, with its first reveal being in February of 2010 and the game releasing later in October of the same year. New Vegas builds off the base that Fallout 3 set, using the same same engine, character, weapon, and environmental models, as well as some voice actors. But just because it borrows heavily from its predecessor doesn't diminish what Obsidian was able to produce. Typically, RPGs can be split into four separate categories, the story and writing, the combat system, the role-playing elements, and the open-world sandbox that encapsulates everything. Unlike the clean, wholesome America you may recall, the wasteland will be a distrustful place, full of unsavory characters and few morals. Fallout New Vegas takes place in an alternate reality United States in the year 2281. Set in the Mojave Wasteland and encapsulates a scaled down version of some parts of Nevada, Arizona, Utah, and California. The Mojave is caught in a three-way tug of war between the major factions of New Vegas, being the New California Republic, or NCR, Caesar's Legion, and the mysterious Mr. House, who runs the New Vegas Strip that survived the nuclear blast the rest of the country could not. Stuck in the middle of this three-way conflict is you, the Courier. New Vegas starts out with the Courier being captured by a stylish stranger and his goons who promptly shoot you in the head, leaving you for dead in a shallow grave. Truth is, the game was rigged from the start. The Courier comes to in Doc Mitchell's house, serving as the character builder intro to the game. While I appreciate the world building of Fallout 3 and 4's intro, New Vegas gets you right into the story, which is preferable, especially on repeat playthroughs. Fallout New Vegas' narrative does its best to avoid the traps most open-world RPGs fall into, and that's ludonarrative dissonance. In layman's terms, ludonarrative dissonance can sometimes be described as the disconnect between the player's actions in a video game versus its plot or storytelling. Best example I can give comparatively is Fallout 4. Fallout 4's plot revolves around the player character's desperate search for their missing son, who is kidnapped at the beginning of the game. Plot-wise, the character should inherently continue the search for their son once they exit the vault, but being an open-world game with side quests aplenty, the main quest can be left for later, or even abandoned altogether, as a player faffs about in the open world. New Vegas' trick around this isn't centering the main quest specifically around the three-way conflict between the NCR, Legion, and Mr. House, but instead on the attempted murder of your character. The player has the option to pursue his would-be assassin, or let bygones be bygones, and travel around the Mojave with a second lease on life. The main plot only kicks in after the player learns more about the major three factions and has interacted with them on different occasions. It doesn't solve the ludonarrative dissonance problem entirely, but it handles it in a way where it's never a glaring issue that breaks the immersion. Player choice is at the core of every mechanic in Fallout New Vegas, and it's exemplified in the choices the player can make throughout the story. Nearly every quest the player embarks on has a choice layered within, and it starts from the beginning of the game onwards. The player awakes in the town of Good Springs, who has a cast of characters the player can meet with and talk to just like every town and settlement New Vegas has to offer. Good Springs is in a bit of a jam when the courier arrives in the scene. Ringo, a settler who's passing by, is attacked and chased to Good Springs by Cobb, the impromptu leader of the criminals recently freed from a nearby NCR prison known as the Powder Gangers. This is the first real decision the player has to make that will resonate throughout their entire playthrough. Being able to talk to Ringo, Cobb, and the citizens of Good Spring allows the player to get each perspective of the situation to make their decision. Do you help Ringo and band with the townsfolk, or do you side with Cobb and take over the small town? Or do you say screw it and ignore the conflict altogether? 
together, heading out into the wastes on your own journey. Each decision will determine your standing in the world of New Vegas thanks to the reputation system. Standing with Good Springs and driving the Powder Gangers back will make you beloved with its people, but marked as an enemy by the Powder Gangers, and vice versa if the tables are turned. This extends to all factions or settlements in the game. A karma system piggybacks off the reputation system, affecting your overall status in the Mojave. Helping citizens out or eliminating threats will raise your karma level, while negative actions like stealing will sour all the goodwill you've accrued. I usually stick to doing Paragon runs of New Vegas or Fallout 3 just because, well, I'm a nice person I guess. But if you want to cause terror and havoc throughout the wasteland, you can. That's the best part about Fallout New Vegas. It's really up to you. While the karma and reputation system ensure there's a good and bad option in most circumstances, the story revolving around the three major factions has a lot more morally gray areas that allow for some thought to be put into decisions. This is where Fallout New Vegas' story rises above Fallout 3 and 4's in my opinion. While I won't spoil anything, the NCR, Caesar's Legion, and Mr. House all have their agendas in the Mojave, with the Courier finding his or her way into the middle of each of them. It centers mainly around the control of the Hoover Dam, and which faction plans on doing what once they have it under their control. While the NCR can be seen as the benevolent good guys, and Caesar the heartless antagonist, each side has their own justifications for their actions that at least make some of their behaviors and methods understandable. For example, the NCR is trying to establish law and order in the wasteland, but in order to do that, they have to take some pretty drastic actions like declaring martial law, discriminating against anyone who is an NCR citizen, or caring only about gathering resources no matter who might be in their way. Caesar himself has this perverted sense of social Darwinism, where the weak don't belong in a world where the strong should prosper. But through his ruthless tactics, killing those who oppose him or enslaving those who don't, Caesar's legion ironically created a more peaceful territory by killing or enslaving the various different raider tribes that would otherwise would have wreaked havoc on wastelanders. Mr. House is somewhere in the middle, providing a much needed distraction from the post-apocalyptic world outside the New Vegas Strip, but conducting more nefarious deeds behind closed doors at the Lucky 38 Casino. The amount of choice players have is quite impressive even by today's standards. Once the courier reaches the New Vegas Strip, the full scope of the plot is revealed with a myriad of ways the story could go based on the player's actions. It makes repeat playthroughs that much more rewarding knowing there's more than one or two ways the game's story can be played out, ensuring playthroughs of New Vegas differ from player to player. This is because the writing is so well executed. For minor characters, the major players, and everyone in between, New Vegas has some of the best writing in almost any RPG I've played. The surprising amount of factions New Vegas has to offer and their codes and ideologies make interacting with them far more fun than it really should be. From the Brotherhood of Steel, the Boomers, the Kings, the Great Cons, Nightkin, the list goes on and on. From comedic to dramatic, Obsidian was able to create compelling characters, stories, and quest lines that had me hooked throughout the entire game. You must learn to deal with these dangers, but may find this challenging at first. While a game like Bioshock is the first person shooter with RPG elements, New Vegas is more of an RPG with shooter elements. Combat is special in modern Fallout games. Just like Bethesda's previous titles, you have the option of playing in either first person or third person. While the option is nice, third person is pretty inconsistent when it comes to interacting with the world or firing weapons, which is why I usually use it for exploration or on long journeys across the wasteland. First person is the view you should be in for most if not all combat encounters. There's a variety of weapons to find when scavenging the Mojave, ranging from melee weapons to shotguns or mini nuke launchers. In a developer diary of Fallout 3, Todd Howard explained how the weapon system works comparative to Oblivion's in an interesting way. Essentially, modern Fallout games are designed in a way where you can come across an overpowered weapon early on in the game, but have little to no ammo for it, causing some interesting choices to be made. You can either save it for a stronger or more difficult encounter, or be forced to use it to survive. This design choice also incentivizes players to search every nook and cranny of the wasteland to either come across these powerful weapons, obtain the elusive ammo, or find scrap rods and ends to sell or and or craft said ammo. New Vegas implements a fantastic weapon mod system that allows you to add attachments to weapons like scopes, extended mags, or upgrades like being able to fire faster or increase damage output. These mods, along with being able to craft variations on ammo, offers much more freedom in the combat space. Companions make the waste less lonely and are improved from Fallout 3. Two companions can follow you on your adventure, now sporting a new companion wheel that lets players tweak behaviors like how aggressive they are in combat, what kind of weapon or attack pattern they should use, or being able to chat or get to know them better. Companions are a great help, especially in combat, taking at least a little bit of the heat off the player when things ultimately get hairy, and they will because the combat itself is not very good, if I'm being honest. It's the weakest part of New Vegas, and by extension Fallout 3 as well. Aiming down sights was added in New Vegas, which helps a little bit, but the control is just off, and firing or swinging at enemies doesn't have too much feedback to make real-time combat satisfying. That's where the vault Tech Assisted Targeting System, or VATS, comes into play. It's the saving grace for an otherwise mediocre combat system. VATS is part re-implementation and part crutch, in a way. VATS did appear in a roundabout way in the original Fallout, serving as the basis for the turn-based combat. In modern Fallouts, VATS slows down time in order to target specific 
body parts, making hectic combat situations much more manageable. VATS isn't just thrown in as an easy kill system though, there's certain strategies that can be used on various enemies. Targeting limbs can cripple enemies, making them slower and less effective in combat. Targeting a weapon in the hands of an enemy can cause that weapon to break or the enemy to drop it, taking them out of the fight if only for a short time. Sentiment enemies have different weak spots compared to others, like humanoid enemies being susceptible to headshots, but insect type enemies having stingers, wings, or other body parts that do more damage when hit. The enemies you face are just as varied as the factions you meet, wielding all sorts of weapons. While they're not as diversified as I would have liked, there's a distinct difference between facing something like a raider, who uses traditional weapons, versus the wildlife of the Mojave, such as fire ants, rad scorpions, or even ghouls who are melee based. Some enemies even cause status effects that players have to watch out for, like Cazador's poisonous sting, or the nuclear glowing ones causing high spikes in radiation. Vats runs off the AP, or action points meter, in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. The more AP you have, the more shots you can take in Vats. Different weapons cost more or less AP depending on their stats, like handguns costing less than shotguns, for example. Each time you enter Vats, you're given percentages on how likely a shot will hit whichever body part you're targeting. Distance is also taken into account, as well as skill, which we'll touch upon in a bit. Sometimes it's beneficial to hit the Vats button to scan an area for enemies and gauge from there what the best play might be. If a target is too far away for a pistol, switching to a hunting or sniper rifle might give you a better shot. A shotgun at far range will give you less of a chance to hit rather than up close, so you get the picture. Plus, kills and vats go into super slow-mo and show the carnage like heads exploding or limbs detaching, and it's always a spectacle. Vats is the reason the combat in New Vegas works. While real-time combat is manageable once you get used to how awkward it is, vats makes it far more enjoyable and statistically connected to the RPG aspects of New Vegas. Regularly study your vault tech provided materials to prepare for survival. And to answer the question, do you know what makes you special? Fallout New Vegas hits all the right notes for me, at least when it comes to its role-playing mechanics. At the start of the game, there's a fairly robust character creator, which is par for the course in Bethesda games. You're given the chance to spec into seven general categories, strength, perception, endurance, charisma, intelligence, agility, and luck, or special. Each special category encapsulates different skills such as strength affecting how much melee damage you do, or charisma affecting your speech or bartering ability. It's a nice little system that allows players to choose an immediate boost to certain skills they know they will use throughout the game. Like most RPGs, actions taken throughout the wasteland, like killing enemies, completing quests, or passing skill checks, grants the player experience points. Gain enough, and you level up. Pretty typical stuff, but once you level up, players have the ability to use skill points to spec into a bunch of different skills, like the aforementioned speech ability, proficiency in energy weapons, or how well players can hack a computer. Each other level grants the player a choice of one perk to apply to their character. These are special buffs or debuffs that can complement a certain playstyle player's favor, such as increasing critical hits and vats, gaining extra skill points per level, or increasing the amount of radiation you can take. Being able to spec into whatever category you want allows for many different playstyles. Going in guns a-blazing? Pick a perk that maximizes damage output or greater accuracy. Want to smooth talk your way throughout the Mojave? Spec into the speech or barter skill. Want to sneak around undetected, or pick any lock, or maximize your healing items? You have those options, and it's incredibly satisfying to build your own unique character throughout the entire game. This extends to the smallest aspects of Fallout New Vegas. While it doesn't lean as hard on the survival aspect as future titles would, New Vegas has its own fair share of micromanaging elements I genuinely love. It's not everyone's cup of irradiated tea, but having to constantly keep track of your health and rad levels, your armor's damage threshold, your weapon durability, and yes, even your max weight, keeps my mind active during the whole of New Vegas. Again, I know not a lot of people like micromanaging aspects like this, but making sure to keep enough stin packs handy, looking out for duplicates of weapons to use for repair jobs, collecting scrap and other knickknacks to craft more or better ammo, choosing what's essential and what's not to not be over encumbered, is just something I enjoy. There is even a hard core mode that takes things like hunger and thirst into account for those looking for a more of a challenge. While I touched upon it in the story section, I wanted to point out just how impressive the dialogue system in New Vegas is. Similar to its predecessor, you can engage in conversations with NPCs around the Mojave. Most conversations are extensive, asking characters about their past, who they are, what they do, their opinions on other factions, the works. Couple that with the multiple ways conversations could go based on your standing in the Mojave, your speech, barter, or other skills, your alliance with different factions, etc. Conversations have the potential to go on for up to four or five minutes sometimes. While it's a staple in most RPGs, most notably games like Mass Effect, New Vegas' dialogue system is so robust it's a breath of fresh air compared to future titles. Inventory is a big part of RPGs, and Fallout has a pretty great one. Healing items like foods or drugs with different buffs, books or magazines that can increase certain stats either permanently or temporarily respectively, not to mention access to a map with fast travel, notes you may have picked up along the way, scrap you can use for crafting or selling, and of course, your overall statistic. All of this and much more is done through one of the coolest UIs in gaming. 
the pit boy i adore the pit boy the clicks and beeps of switching to other menus the crt like screen the built-in radio it's that added layer of world building that makes the fallout universe one of my favorites that's because the setting is so unique and it makes it stand out in a now oversaturated post-apocalyptic genre your advanced know-how will grant you access to new places and new technologies space age isn't it the retro futuristic mashup of the high tech mixed with 1950s art, music, clothing, and style culminate in something incredibly special. While the culture of the US and the world in the 50s remained the same, scientific innovations flourished, propelling the world forward. Everything from the robot designs to the cars to the buildings to the weapons all look like what the future might have looked like to someone in the 1950s. There's really nothing like the Fallout universe, and New Vegas takes the core concepts of the Fallout art style and runs with it in a new and exciting direction. Since Fallout has been acquired by Bethesda, it seems like it's been stuck in this perpetual, generic Fallout mold. Vault Boy? Check. Brotherhood of Steel? Check. Nuka-Cola? Super Mutants? Raiders? Check, check, and check. Fallout New Vegas is the only outlier in the modern Fallout games that really feels different, not just in its locales, but in its theming as well. New Vegas gives off this Wild West cowboy feel, with weapons and clothing reminiscent of those times. Scavengers are called Prospectors, old mining towns still stand around the Mojave, the NCR's elite soldiers are called Rangers, complete with cowboy hats, repeaters, and revolvers. It's no Red Dead by any means, but it's able to differentiate itself from past and future titles, and it allows players to really get lost in its world. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention its namesake when talking about the world Obsidian created. The New Vegas Strip is fantastic, and the way it's built up throughout the story makes finally arriving a treat. With the Strip being a focal point, New Vegas offers some very appropriate new side activities like blackjack, slots, and other gambling games. New Vegas isn't the only noteworthy location in the Mojave though. Novak, Jacobstown, the Brotherhood Steel Hideout, Sunset Sarsaparilla Plant, the Repcon Facility. While the open wastes can be barren at times, there's some really great locations in New Vegas, which makes the Mojave Wasteland and a pleasure to explore. And exploring is one of my favorite activities in any Fallout game, thanks to a few things. There's so many different characters to find and talk to, abandoned buildings to scavenge and loot, settlements to visit, and enemies to kill, there's always something to do. The simple act of finding locations throughout the wasteland is fun, granting XP and marking a spot on the map to fast travel to. It's got that completionist type quality to it where I end up chasing these little markers down here to find a nearby place I haven't discovered yet. More often than not, I find myself headed towards a quest marker only to get sidetracked by some building or structure off in the distance, end up getting sidetracked far longer than I anticipated. That's the magic of open world RPGs when executed right, but Fallout flourishes in the quiet moments of travel thanks in part to the radio and the Pip-Boy I mentioned earlier. Ever since first hearing Butcher Pete while traveling the Capital Wasteland in Fallout 3, I've discovered an entire library of music I otherwise wouldn't have listened to. Songs from the 40s, 50s, and 60s that exist in the Fallout universe, from legendary performers like Elsa Fitzgerald, The Ink Spots, Bing Crosby, Billie Holiday, Cole Porter, the list goes on and on. New Vegas takes it a step further with its song selection by tailoring it more towards that Sin City feel. Songs like Ain't That a Kick in the Head by Dean Martin, Marty Robbins' Big Iron, and Blue Moon by Frank Sinatra, among more, play while traversing the Mojave, curated by Mr. New Vegas, played by Mr. Vegas himself, Wayne Newton. The radio DJ has been a staple of most modern Fallout games, and it's an ingenious narrative device. While players complete missions and affect the world around them, Mr. New Vegas will interrupt the fantastic soundtrack to report on the goings-on. Rumors persist about a super mutant refuge nestled high in the ski lodge to the northwest. If you should find it, do not, repeat, do not belittle a super mutant for taking the bunny slope. It's oddly satisfying to hear a report about some deed you did somewhere in the Mojave, or a bit of news coming from a place you haven't been to yet. It organically updates the further you get into the game, and while stories can be repeated at times, it's still another layer of world building and immersion that draws me into the world of Fallout. There really isn't anything quite like traveling the Mojave at night, listening to Nat King Cole's Love Me As If There Were No Tomorrow as the moon shines off the irradiated waters of the Colorado River. Fallout New Vegas has an incredible amount of content to offer in its base game, but Bethesda and Obsidian added a substantial amount of post-launch content in the forms of four hefty expansion packs along with some weapon and armor packs. Dead Money, Honest Hearts, Old World Blues, and Lonesome Road are legitimate expansion packs, adding entire new areas, storylines, characters, weapons, and level caps, similar to how Fallout 3 did it. This is how you do DLC. I highly recommend the Ultimate Edition of New Vegas with all the DLC included. It's on Steam and even backwards compatible with Xbox One for like 20 bucks. It's it's really a steal and a half. Fallout New Vegas is special. It's one of those games you can lose yourself in. It's the reason why Obsidian's latest project, The Outer Worlds, was so hyped up and ended up being incredibly successful. Is it the prettiest game? Not necessarily. Is it rough around the edges? Yeah, a bit. But I can look past the visual and performance flaws to see an incredible RPG experience unmatched in its writing, charm, and freedom. Here's hoping Bethesda gives Obsidian one more shot at the Fallout universe. Discourage.
judging the word and my skin is not